It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. And I feel fine. I'm Dr. Ryan Lozano from the Philosophy Department. Uh, technically, we are now the Philosophy, Psychology, and Education Department here at San Antonio College. And today is the sixth annual special edition Halloween lecture. Today we are talking about, thank you, thank you. Today we are talking about the apocalypse. Woo! Book of Revelation, the end of the world as we know it. So, who's read the book? It is quite possibly the most frequently cited or quoted or feared book that is the least read of all of these books. And so, uh, it's sometimes also called the uh, apocalypse. The Revelation of St. John the Divine, or St. John the Apostle, or St. John of Patmos, which may possibly be different people, uh, but we're going to look at this just from the terms of what is this in the situation of apocalyptic literature, uh, what is that as a literary genre, what does this specifically contain. Uh, this is told as a future of our people. Now the main thing that we encounter when we read this book usually not in a church setting, but more often in popular culture, is, is it an accurate description of what's going to happen to us at the end time? Okay, is this what we can look forward to? Is this what we ought to be dreading? And so we're going to look at the historical context today, uh, in which it's situated, and uh, try and understand how it might have been read by the earliest audience. Uh, readers in the first century were a lot more accustomed than we are to reading apocalyptic literature. Uh, this would have been part of their expectation of daily life, is that at any given time, the end could come. Now, the word apocalypsis, here, as it appears in Greek, and of course, apocalypse, is hidden from view, hidden from our sight, or that which is about to be revealed unto us. Uh, most of us, when we talk about apocalyptic literature, we are looking at... Uh, Mad Max, or The Walking Dead. How about this guy, huh? Uh, King Joffrey is no longer the most hated man on TV. And uh, we've got Book of Eli over there. Even Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan is kind of this apocalyptic approach, where we talk about the state of nature, where in life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Now, the one apocalypse that we've got is just one of several that are out there. Uh, this was a very, very popular genre in which to write, and we'll talk about a few that are out there. Now, like all literary genres, there are some common features that we can identify, and here they are. Almost all of these works are pseudonymous. Uh, what we mean by that, they were written under a pseudonym, because, let's face it, nobody's interested in hearing about the end of the world according to Jeff, or the end of the world according to Harry. However... If it's John, John the Apostle, or Peter, or Paul, well now suddenly we all sit up and take interest. And so most of these are going to claim to have been written by either one of the Apostles or one of those people that we closely associate uh, with Christianity, or in the case of Judaism, one of the prophets, and so on. Uh, the reason being possibly twofold. One, it's a lot easier to get your work read if, someone, if they think that someone famous wrote it. Two, it was very common in the ancient world to write and attribute things to your teacher. So it's possible that this could have been an apostle of the apostles, or a disciple of the disciples, writing saying, it's not my work, but it's in the patrimony of Paul, or Peter, or John, or whoever. Uh, these are all going to be very, very highly uh, symbolic in their writing, very allegorical. You interpret it in the text. So there will be the vision, the depiction of whatever is going to happen, and then usually an angel uh, is going to come along and say, now this is what this stands for, and this is what this means. The revelation that we're going to talk about today is a little unusual in that it's not fully explained. A couple different theories attend that. One is that parts of it are simply missing, or that parts of it were edited out. This was kind of a contentious book of its time. It still is, but it very nearly didn't make it into the canon of accepted scripture. Uh, that it's the only full book of apocalyptic literature that's accepted in the, uh, the Christian canon is kind of unique. And so we may be missing bits of it. It's not meant to be interpreted literally. Seriously, just don't. 
Yeah. No, really. If we look at the Middle Ages, it did not work out well when they interpret these books literally. Uh, this is one of ongoing concern because we see a lot of groups of people that are inclined to take the events that are recorded in Revelation and try and understand it as literally we need to be looking for the moon to turn to blood, literally we need to look for the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and they just, they're misguided in their reading of this, unfortunately. Uh, there is almost always, not always, but almost always, a triumphal ending. Uh, so, God will prevail, and this is the part that's critical, especially to the audience for which this was written, is readers are on the hook. They want to get a happy ending out of the story, and they almost always are guaranteed one of this. Now, the worldview that uh, comes out of this is one of ancient Near Eastern, or what today we would call Middle Eastern religion. Uh, and a lot of it stems from Zoroastrianism, uh, the religion of ancient Persia, which is probably the oldest continually practiced religion. Uh, here we have the struggle between good and evil taking place in a Zoroastrian depiction. Zoroastrianism features what we call a cosmogonic dualism, meaning that the world is created out of two forces, good and evil, but an eschatological monotheism. So at the end of time, one god will prevail, defeating good and evil. But we start out with kind of those dueling forces there. And since most of us don't know eschatology, or use it on a regular basis, the eschaton is the Greek word for the end, where that connotes talking about the end. At the end of this particular story, God will prevail over these things. Now to best understand the context in which Apocalypse was written, we've got to understand sort of what other genres were going on and what had come before this. Now, this comes out of Judaism predominantly, and we start off with a covenantal understanding okay, that God has erected a covenant with man and provided they follow his commandments. In this case, Mel Brooks showing the 15 commandments before the one gets broken in History of the World Part 1. <laughs> but provided uh, that we follow God's commandments, that covenant will be established, and in this case, the people of Israel will be protected. Uh, as we get into the prophetic worldview, our ancient Jewish prophets come along, uh, they understand themselves to still be under terms of the covenant, but we're far enough removed from that covenant's establishment that we've forgotten our role in it. We've gotten away from the commandments, we're not quite obeying it, and so the prophets come along and inevitably say three things to us. One, there is only one God. Two, you're doing it wrong. Three, here's what you're supposed to be doing instead. That if the Israelites would return to God, he would ease their torments, and they would once again prosper and prevail. And then finally, out of this, comes this apocalyptic worldview. This seems to come out of kind of a frustration uh, with the prophetic and the covenantal view, where we're suffering maybe not because of our sins, as was the view uh, usually given by the prophets, but because now there's an evil force that's opposed to God, that's trying to draw God's people away from him. Um, this very particular kind of Zoroastrian, then Jewish, then Christian, then Muslim understanding of how the apocalypse would come about, uh, follows kind of a pattern of isms. So here are the isms that we usually associate with this. Uh, the first of them up there is dualism. There's this definite sense that there is good, and there is evil, and everything, and all of creation, and everyone is sided with either one or the other. Uh, history is also understood dualistically in this. In the current age, whenever it happens to be, whether it's the first century or now, the 21st century, History is understood dualistically as we're under the sway of evil. But good is about to come. Any minute now, any day, we can expect good. Good will triumph, and evil will be defeated. Now, there's also a sense of pessimism that goes throughout these. Because the current age is evil, things are probably going to get a lot worse before they get better. And so we have descriptions throughout this of things getting much, much worse. Triumphalism. At the end of the current age of evil, God, representing good, will ultimately triumph over evil, bring about his ideal worldly kingdom. And at this point, all the dead are going to be raised again bodily uh, to face the last judgment. Evil will be punished, and ultimately good will be rewarded. The last one up there, I'm going to admit I made that word up. So if you run a spell check, that is actually false, but it ought to be a word. Let's bring it back. Ashley. 
hashtag imminentism. Now, imminentism is this guy idea that recalling the name Emmanuel means God is with us. This is kind of the approach. We understand God's arrival to be something happening very soon, or expected very soon, and that we ought to be preparing for by repenting, by turning to God. And these four isms really tend to direct apocalyptic literature, both in the Old and the New Testament, and outside of it. Now, the Old Testament features chunks of apocalypse. These are instances of apocalyptic passages or chapters uh, that show up. For instance, in Isaiah, the Lord devastates the earth, and then there's a supplicatory song of praise. And then there's a celebratory song of praise. So we've got that anticipation of God coming, and that thank you God for coming, and then ultimately Israel will be delivered. Also in Isaiah, uh, in uh, the later chapters there, that should actually be 33 through 35, not 25, this is the Israelites experiencing distress. They call out to God for help. There is a judgment that comes across the nations, and then the joy is experienced as they're redeemed. In Jeremiah, Day and the night will cease, they just stop, and the line of David will be broken. Okay, so presaging what we're going to see in the New Testament. In Ezekiel, the Lord's great victory over the nation, and restoring to Jacob's as representing uh, Israel's fortune. In Joel, the sun and the moon both darken, so we have a simultaneous solar and then lunar eclipse. Stars will no longer shine, the Lord will roar from Zion, heavens and earth will tremble, then blessings for God's people. Oops, a little too far. In Zechariah, Jerusalem's enemies will be destroyed. The one that they pierced will be mourned. So again, present in New Testament. The house of David will be cleansed from sin. The shepherd will be uh, struck and the sheep scattered and the Lord will come and reign. Now, there is one fully apocalyptic account that we find in the Old Testament that occurs in Daniel chapter 7 through 12. Daniel dreams of four beasts and the descriptions are scary. Each one's more horrible than the one preceding it. They're based on lions, on bears, on eagles, on leopards, uh, kind of semi-humanoid figures. They're going to then be destroyed by the Son of Man. There's a portion where the dream is interpreted by the angel. Another vision of a ram and a goat. Another interpretation. A supplicatory prayer on Daniel's part. And then the 70 of 7, uh, which has been interpreted various ways. Uh, this is the foundation of, uh, for instance, uh, some aspects of Seventh-day Adventism uh, and some of the other American innovations within religion. The New Testament has miniature apocalypses within it. Uh, in Matthew 24, we have the destruction of the temple uh, being predicted. At the time it was written, it was probably a retrodictive account of it, but predicted as it shows up in Matthew. The end times, where the day and the hour aren't known. And there's several references throughout that uh, to Daniel, to Isaiah. Uh, in the very next chapter, you get the separating of the sheep and the goats. So that uh, occurs in Matthew 25, and that is an apocalyptic vision. In Mark 13, it's the exact same as the Matthew account, uh, because both are synoptic gospels. In 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, the man of lawlessness remi and reminders to stand firm. And then, of course, the entire book of Revelation, uh, which is, well, ascribed to John, unlikely to be the same person that wrote the Gospel account. Uh, there are also several non-canonical accounts that, for whatever reasons, were not included in Scripture, either in the Old Testament or the New Testament, but are easily found and interesting to read for purposes of uh, comparison. And again, we see that pseudonymous tendency. A lot of them are ascribed, in this case, to Abraham, to Adam, uh, Baruch, Daniel, Elijah, Ezra, Lamech, uh, the Metatron, not the same character from Dogma. Uh, in this case, it ties to the books of Enoch, which if you saw the movie from a couple years ago, Noah, uh, the big rock creatures that are throwing rocks to fight off two volcanoes, that comes from Enoch, but is not actually found in the Genesis account. Of Sedrach, of Zephaniah, of Zerubbabel, Gabriel's separate revelation, and then the Aramaic apocalypse. All of these are non canonical, but specifically Jewish apocalypses. There are non canonical Christian ones too. Uh, James has an apocalypse, Golius, Methodius, Paul, plus a Coptic version, uh, Peter, plus a Gnostic version, 
Uh, the Kalamun, this one now exists only in Arabic, because we've got an early translation of it. Of Stephen, the proto-martyr, of Thomas, uh, there's also a Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, and that of the Seven Heavens, which seems to have probably actually shown up sometime in the, uh, in the Middle Ages. Now, the basic idea of the Apocalypse of John is that he is a prophet, and to be understood as a prophet. So these are some of those that we encountered earlier, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Joel, and now here comes John, that he's following the Israelites, uh, he's shown and reveals to his readers the coming destruction of the earth to prepare for the second coming of Christ, the final judgment, and that ultimate triumph over evil. And so what I'm going to go through really, really quick is a summary of all of those major things that take place in the book. Uh, so John is said to be on the island Patmos, which is down here. Uh, this is modern-day Turkey, uh, so the, the ancient Near East. And the first part are messages for the seven churches of Asia. And they are these seven that are located here. I have various messages based on certain things that word has gotten to John is taking place in those areas. Uh, we then have an appearance of the throne of God, surrounded by 24 thrones with 24 elders. And there is a description of a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. And various pictures are out there. Um, these are some of the things that people, because they don't read the book, have no idea are in the book. Uh, but it really is kind of interesting. We hear about the seven seals and those events that, uh, that accompany each of those. Probably the most familiar to most people are the riders of the horses. So we've got a white horse, a red horse, a black horse, and then a pale horse. And depending on your translation, it'll either say a pale horse, a sick horse, even a green horse, uh, and their riders being the personifications of the seven horse or of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, there is an interlude following the breaking of the sixth seal, uh, and this is uh, where quite a bit takes place. We've actually got I've got these out of order. You've got the 144,000 mentioned during the interlude there. And that, of course, is not a literal number, because we shouldn't take this literally. It's uh, 12 representing the religion, or the tribes of Israel, or the apostles, times a thousand, times 12,000, so giving us a notion of a great many. There are seven trumpets that are blown uh, throughout all of this, and various things take place. Some of them replicating the ancient uh, the plagues against Egypt, like the locusts, for instance, uh, the turning to blood. And uh, accompanying this, we have descriptions of a woman in white, we have a great dragon, we have a great many beasts, uh, and then overcoming all of this, the lamb will occur. Now, probably one of the most uh, frequently cited uh, instances in this is the, uh, the famous Mark of the Beast. And uh, people have attempted to use Walt Disney's logo. They've said that you can look at Monster and find that uh, in Hebrew numerals, uh, that the back of certain dollar bills will contain this. I don't know, I'm kind of inclined to believe the one about Google Chrome. <laughs> they may be on something there. But, <laughs> but what this is, um, this is what we call gematria. It, you take numbers, and Hebrew and Greek don't have separate numbers. The numbers that we use are either Roman numerals or what we call Arabic numerals. Uh, and so in this case, uh, this is the verse in which it appears. It's Revelation 13, 18. This calls for wisdom. So they're telling us, you're going to have to know something about how to do this. If anyone has insight, let them calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number, and his number is 666. And so from Aleister Crowley to, uh, to Charles Manson and many other people, they've really keyed in on this as the mark of the beast. Now, what happens is, if you spell out the name of this man, check out the neckbeard, uh, that's the Roman emperor Nero. Um, and if we write his name in Hebrew, it does add up through this geometrical uh, to 666. Uh, there is, in the Greek, Version because remember, Revelation is written in Greece. Irenaeus guesses it might be these gods. These are separate interpretations of either Roman emperors or other effects during the time. 
Now, we do know that Nero was uh, is usually the the emperor at the time of Paul's martyrdom. I'm sorry, of Paul's martyrdom and Peter's martyrdom. Uh, Peter was crucified upside down, and Paul was beheaded in Rome during the reign of Nero. And so it stands to reason that the author of this text, remembering that as a relatively recent event, is going to include that as the worst possible thing uh, to have taken place. Uh, there are seven bowls that are opened during this. Uh, and they, of course, each has uh, significant symbolic value. There's a specific reference to the Euphrates, so we know that we're situating this in an ancient Near Eastern cultural context again. Uh, the Whore of Babylon is one of those famous figures that also gets brought up very frequently. Uh, note how many heads the beast that she's riding has. Seven. And the Seven Hills of Rome, or the City of Seven Hills as it's typically known. So this is, we're almost certain, a reference to uh, the City of Rome, the Power of Rome, uh, which in the lives of first century Christians living under active persecution, would have been the most awful thing that they could imagine. Now, at the end of this, we say we're called to the marriage of the Supper of the Lamb. So, this is wherein the great multitude comes together. They praise God. There's a judgment of the two beasts, the dragon, ultimately the dragon's imprisoned in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, and you get an idea of a thousand year reign, which gives rise to millennial interpretations of the church. Uh, terms like premillennial, postmillennial, and so on get thrown around. Based on this, uh, there is a reference to the New Jerusalem that will be established. And again, it has symbolic meaning that follows through. Uh, that after this great battle that will take place, after the imprisonment of the dragon, and after the final judgment, uh, Jerusalem will rise again uh, and will become the heavenly city. The uh, entire book of Revelation can be demonstrated like this. Uh, this is a fairly old image of it, and this is kind of a biased interpretation of the events going on uh, in the context of 19th century Protestantism, but it's fairly complete in its representation. Uh, at the end of the book, we have this as one of the final verses, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And the very end of the, uh, the book itself ends with a blessing. So it is not the doom and gloom that is sometimes uh, reported. And how should we read this book now if we're going to? Uh, well, certainly not literally. Uh, don't look for the signs of the apocalypse, or the seals being broken, or trumpets being blown, or, uh, or heavenly figures showing up, or anything like that. But do read it as indicative of kind of this apocalyptic literature genre. Uh, read it as indicative of the thinking of first century Christians uh, and others in their world and sharing their worldview. And, and do read it as kind of a uniquely canonical example of this type of writing.